Welcome to the No Sports Report, a production of iHeartRadio and Treefort Media. My name is Jensen Karp, and I'm a sports fan, and I miss watching it. But over the past few weeks doing this podcast, I've realized maybe sports is just a conduit for normalcy. Maybe I miss normalcy, and I, really all of us, think sports can help get us there again. And the truth is, it can. Maybe even in more ways than you think, and even if we're off the field just trying to rebuild. So as we face unprecedented times in this country, I continue to talk to athletes and sports industry professionals about what they're doing right now, hoping to figure out if they miss competing as much as I miss watching it. This is the No Sports Report. Craig Hodges played in the NBA for 10 seasons and is considered one of the greatest three-point shooters of all time. He's one of only two players to win three consecutive three-point contests during All-Star Weekend. The other is Larry Bird. Hodges also holds the record for the most consecutive shots made in the contest with 19 and is tied for most points scored in a single round at 25. He won two NBA championships with the early 90s Bulls alongside Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen and was an instant offensive threat. But it was the threat of Craig off the court as a political activist that seemed to outshine his undeniable stats. When the team visited the White House to celebrate their NBA championship, his decision to wear a daishiki and attempt to get a letter to President Bush found him labeled as militant and a problem within the NBA. He questioned Black representation in the league and had revolutionary ideas for African-American players to shine a light on issues within the Black community. A year later, his time in Chicago ended abruptly, and he was then ignored and denied a workout with any other team in the league. It became obvious to anyone following the game at the time that he was being blackballed. The following year, he became the first free agent to compete during All-Star Weekend, defending his three-point championship in an NBA logo jersey, since he couldn't get signed by a specific team. As our nation faces a familiar problem of prejudice and racial inequality, I can't help but notice Craig Hodges has been at the front and center of these issues since he entered professional sports in the 80s, and he paid the price for it. Today, we talk about his past, our present, and his hopes for the future. This is Craig Hodges on the No Sports Report. Call from Craig Hodges. To accept, press 1. Hello, Craig. Yes. Uh, I wanted to first start off just by asking where you've been quarantined and how you're holding up during the the COVID pandemic. Well, first of all, I just thank God for hopefully everybody's well and safe during this crazy period of time, man. I'm in Chicago right now in the South Suburb. Well, I'm happy to hear that everything's going well with you, but clearly uh, the events of this past weekend unfolding, I wanted to talk to someone who has had a racial identity and politics that I've always looked up to and helped shaped you know, help shape me as sort of a white kid growing up in the suburbs. And and even if this wasn't a sports podcast, you truly were the first name that I said when asked. And it means a lot for me to be able to talk to you today. So for people who don't know who Craig Hodges is, is there any way you could kind of go over your upbringing and how, as a kid, you first got into activism growing up? Yeah, well, once again, I was blessed uh, that my soul came down in the Hodges household June 27, 1960, at the height of the Civil Rights Movement. Um, my mom was instrumental in the and as far as being the secretary of the movement in the South Suburbs. And, you know, during that period of time, there wasn't babysitters. So, well, mom went, she went. And I was at all the meetings watching live leadership, watching Robert Lowe, who was the president of the organization, and to see how it was when, you know, when everybody was oppressed from the same, feeling the same pressure from the same place, whether you were a millionaire or a bus driver. And for me, uh, I, I recall coming home, 1968, April 4th, and, and my granny and mom crying like I'd never seen before, and Dr. King had been murdered. So from that point on, I was on a quest to see what his life meant and how much it meant to so many people. And then to have, you know, models in front of me like Muhammad Ali, John Carlos, Tommy Smith, Jim Brown. And my family was one that was. My granddad was the, he was the director of the parks in our community, and my granny was the homemaker and, and stabilizer. So for me, I was blessed to have aunts who taught me how to read before I went to school. So education was primary, and, and secondary was my athletics. So it was truly um, a training of student athleticism with the overriding principles that get undergirded so the civil rights movement, social activism, and now what we face. It's truly a human rights situation that the planet has to face that has never been talked about or really wanted to 
really look into the depths of it. Yeah, absolutely. And your basketball skills, like you said, your athleticism sent you to the West Coast out to Long Beach State to play where you had a friend become a victim to police brutality, correct? Yeah, no doubt. And uh, once again, you know, I, I thank Tex winner, uh, Laura Rush, himself for recruiting me at Northwestern. And then he got the job at Long Beach State. He took me to Long Beach State. Um, I was blessed to have had Dr. Malana Karinga, who's the founder of Kwanzaa, as my first professor at Long Beach. And I was turned on, and, and that was almost just a reconnection of what I learned as a child and how important what we were doing in the movement was concerned. And during that period of time, um, during my first three years, I had a chance to become friends with a buddy by the name of Ron Settles. He was a, the premier football player, and I was a premier basketball player. And he, the summer before our senior year, he was murdered by the Signal Hill police in um, Signal Hill, California. And, it, it, you know, the day that it happened, it happened June 6th. And I recall before I left, Ron never really came on campus because he lived off campus, but the two days before I got ready to leave, he came on campus looking for me, and he was just telling me how he was going to be ready, he was getting ready in the summer because he knew he was going to get drafted in the NFL and that the Dallas Cowboys was looking at him. And I said, I didn't know who was looking at me, but we were going to have great senior years, and I was coming home to Chicago to train, and then I get a call to find out he had been, he had been hung in his jail cell, and it was... Um, it was a very eye-opening thing for me, and, and that fall when we went back to school, we protested, and, you know, it was a it was valuable lesson for me in as far as how valuable life is and how oftentimes we are looked, at, we are looked upon as equals, and those who wear uniforms oftentimes uh, have a certain ego trip that they're on for whatever reason, and, and Ron happened to be the victim of that. And so many other people, once we uncovered the truth of what was happening in the Hill Hill Police Force. So for me, it was a, it's a never ending quest, man, for truth and justice and for human rights for all people on the planet. Yeah, and I'm such a big fan of your book that was released, which we'll get into a little bit later. And I, I remember, I think the detail is he went to jail for speeding, correct? Yes. And the thing about that was, you know, it was, it was camera showing, and it, it didn't go down to what it said. So it was a lot that went on, man. And, and then to find out that the other victims of the Signal Hill Police Force, which was only like eight police officers, and one of which was a guy by the name of Jerry Brown or Jerry Wilson or something like that. But, you know, it was, it was crazy, man, just to have had that experience as a 20-year-old 20, 20 to know that, you know, life is precious and you have to protect it. And, and when one of your, you know, one of your partners for a victim, you can't, you can't stand by and watch. You have to take some type of proactive measure, but you have to make sure that you maintain the civility and, and what is, um, what is life meant. And, you know, being 20 years old, like you said, and, and the era in which you were, you were in college, like, were there any ramifications for what happened back then? What were the chances of justice actually being served or getting to the truth? Well, you know, during that, that was uh, one of Johnny Cochran's first big cases. So he was able to get the family um, some restitution. But, you know, I think at that point in time, it was, we were still in that climate where cops having violence against young black men within urban centers all over the country. That was at the height of that, you know, and it was the height of the, all of the, the stuff coming along with the crack and everything else. So it was one of those things where, you're almost suspect on site you know, as opposed to what, what actually went down. So, you know, we have to realize that all of what we're feeling today is a combination of a lot that's gone on for over 400 years, man. And now the country is coming to a drastic reality of, you know, and it's not just black people. I think um, people of all, all nationalities and ethnicities and cultures and uh, religions are seeing the reality of the injustice that's gone on against black men and black people in America for years. Absolutely. And and so let's get to the NBA. You have an incredible 10-year career playing with the San Diego Clippers, the Bucks, the Suns, but most notably the Chicago Bulls. You won two championships with them. The team, obviously, we've been seeing a lot of during the pandemic with Michael Jordan uh, in 91 and 92. After winning the 92 championship, you visit the White House, uh, as most teams do that win, and uh, you visit the president at the time, which is George Bush, and and explain to people who don't know the story what controversy came out of this visit. 
Well, you know, actually it was uh, October 1st, 1991, we went up to the first championship. And, okay. And um, uh, gave President Bush a letter. Actually, I wrote the letter the night before we went, and I had planned on wearing the African dashiki, you know, because that's how I was taught growing up, is that whenever you come to a royal event, you come with your culture. And for me, it was, uh, it was probably one of the greatest days in my life, man, and as far as representing... Um, people who can't represent themselves and, and delivering their message to the most powerful man on earth. Whether he read it or not, I don't know, but uh, through my research for my book, and, and the book is, uh, has been optioned by the producers of Black Mirror in Britain, so we are getting ready to have a documentary and feature film come out on the book, which is, you know, is another great thing for me in as far as being able to utilize it as an economic vehicle as opposed to just my own personal wealth for me and my family. Um, and, you know, those are the beautiful things for me, man, just knowing that within the context of how you raise, you can stand on principle. And, you know, the the chance for me to take go to the White House, regardless of what it, it, what it may have cost me on an immediate level the next four or five years, which I felt I could have played, uh, it gave me a chance to, you know, become closer and tighter with my son and to see and being able to be in their lives on a level that I hadn't been for years because of the league. So it was a blessing and a burden during that period of time, but now I see it for what it is. It was lessons learned and, you know, lessons learned for this period of time where we can, you know, be strong and, and courageous and, and be strategic in the manner in which we come out of this thing and not be reactionary and violent. And you were uh, only 32 at, at that time, correct? Yes, same age as uh, Kevin Durant. <laughs> right, same age as Durant now. I mean, someone watching from afar, right? So for, for research for this, I remember you being in a daishiki was, was a very big deal in the press. And doing research for this, I thought that I would find pictures and that you would be very much ostracized at the White House and not smiling. And I, it was literally the exact opposite. You're having a ball. Jo- George Bush asked you to shoot a three-pointer. You guys are all laughing together. I'm so surprised by the militant angle that was taken by the press and to people like me who were sports fans at the time about that visit and the letter, which I remember people saying was about the Gulf War, but but it wasn't. You, you had a completely different angle in the letter. Absolutely. And that's the part where, you know, the spin that can happen from professional sports franchises, from professional sports in general, is, is media-driven. And if the media is in tune with the franchise, if the franchise has a certain look at a player, then that player is going to be tilted in that light. And for me, it was one that, you know, he's persona non grata. Don't, you know, no one asked me what the letter said until I did a 30 for 30 with ESPN, and and they never showed it, (laughs) which is funny to me again, of how you could come out and do a whole documentary about the letter and then never release it because of whatever. And when we were filming and I told him, I said, they're not going to let you show this because it's too important and it's too clear. And it wasn't anything bashing America or any of that. It's just laying down the historical facts of what my people have been through, as well as those who have been disenfranchised. It's not just about black people. It's about brown, yellow, red, and white who have all been um, totally disenfranchised in so many ways because it's only about the rich and the powerful that have uh, been able to flex their their will and power over people. And you become a free agent at that time after this, you know, quote unquote controversy, and you don't get any right. any tryouts from any other teams in the NBA. Even the Bulls coach, who you know Phil Jackson at the time, who was coaching, who doesn't understand even looking back now how someone with your three point average uh, and and you know your athleticism at thirty two wasn't given that. And so a lot of people in the league believed you had been blackballed. Right. And you know, the funny part about it is that um, when I came into the league in 1982, I was drafted to 48th player selected. Mm -hmm. There was no three-point shot in college basketball during that period of time. So when people look at my career and they say, man, he's a three-point shooter, that's cool. But I'm a professional basketball player. And and my my basketball intellect is, you know, I I challenge anybody on the planet. When we want to sit down and talk basketball and strategy, let's get at it. Mm -hmm. So from that end, I was taught by the best. I was taught by Tex Winter. I came into the league under Paul Silas. I had Jimmy Lynham. I had uh, Don. I had Don Nelson. I had Cotton Pitt Simmons. I had Bill Collins, and I had Phil Jackson. Yeah. And then when we talk about the staffs 
just the coaching staffs under Phil Jackson alone. When you talk about 100 years of service, when you talk about Johnny Bach, Jim Clemens, uh, Tex Winter, and Frank Hamlin, you're talking about, oh, you know, you're talking about guys who have, you could just, you could just learn from them just by sitting next to them and not saying anything. <laughs> yeah, so, right, right. So for the fact that you know, you're coming off a two world championship and three consecutive three point titles and no one wants to even bring you in, it's, it's crazy. Insane. You know? Yeah. And, and before this instance, and I remember this from the book, you, you had talked to Magic Johnson and Michael Jordan about boycotting that game one of the NBA finals as a response to the beating of Rodney King. And, and they looked at you like it was crazy, right? <laughs> and you know, the funny part is, is that <clears throat> when we look at the hierarchy of both society and then whatever realm you're in, there's a certain pecking order. And if you're on the bottom part of that pecking order, people ain't hearing you, man. It's almost, you know, you casting aside anything that I'm saying to a degree, unless we're on the court hooping, I guess. But, you know, for me, it was one of those things where I had talked to Michael about, you know, opening up the same manufacturing we have overseas in America and us being able to produce shoes and, and stuff here. And that's the part that I felt like we kind of missed the boat in as far as the 1991 championship on both levels, Chicago and Los Angeles, two of the biggest media markets. What would happen if we would have said, we're going to have a work stoppage and we want to change the condition mm -hmm. of police and civilians? And, you know, we want to protect the serve to really mean something. But at that take period of time, I was asking us to boycott in order to create some type of uh, ownership black ownership within the league, have the league look reflective on the ownership level to what was on the court. And it continues today. You know, I seen yesterday where the league is talking about some type of in, um, racial justice committee or whatever. I'm glad to see that. Hopefully they'll bring in uh, McMood, Abdul Rao, for myself and other players who I'm sure feel like they have been castigated in the past. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was right around the same time of the the beating of Rodney King, correct? Of that game that you would you would ask maybe to boycott. Absolutely, and it was in '91, and that's you know, and that's the thing where you know, oftentimes, man, I think you know, we have that ability to turn a blind eye or play ignorance to causes and issues because it's not uh, palpable to the endorsements we may have or to a deal we may be trying to strike or whatever, and we have to start to put the human the human condition above money. And that through that, I think, is uh, one of the things that I have a lot of love for is what LeBron has been doing and, and not being afraid to stand with what's right, man. Everybody knows what's right. Yeah. Well, ironically, I thought, I mean, I thought of you pretty quickly when I saw on Sunday that Michael Jordan put out a three-paragraph statement about racism and brutality. Did Did you get to read it? Yeah, I seen it this morning, man, and I was, and I'm, and I, you know, once again, man, I, I give applause where applause is, is due, man, and I love my brother, and I never, never have not, mm -hmm. you know, I just didn't uh, agree with a lot of, a lot of the uh, principles that he supported and endorsed, and as far as products and and the like, so, but to, you know, it's not on me to judge anyone; it's it's on everyone to come to their consciousness and do what they feel necessary at a given time. Right. But too much is given, much is required. I was with them when they were riding in Miami and riding stopped just so we could come down to Miami so they could see Michael Jordan play. Mm -hmm. So I know the power and impact that he has. So him putting out a statement is is very really good and it's um it's timely and hopefully it, it will just be the start of much more. More with Craig Hodges after this. Right now, Feeding America is working tirelessly to ensure our most vulnerable populations, like students who are out of school, the elderly, individuals whose jobs are impacted, and low-income families continue to have access to food and other needed resources during the COVID-19 pandemic. The Feeding America Food Bank Network is committed to serving communities and people facing hunger in America, and their greatest need is donations and support of local food banks. This podcast is committed to donating a portion of the proceeds from the show to Feeding America, and we hope that you can join us in this effort too. Find out how you can help at feedingamerica.org backslash COVID-19. And now the rest of my chat with NBA legend and activist Craig Hodges. So let's talk about this past weekend now. What went through your head when you saw the horrific video, the uh, the murdering of, of George Floyd? Well, it's just uh, it's a continuation, man. And 
I think for, I think everyone, any human being saw the wickedness in it, saw the unholiness in it, saw the brutality and, you know, the fact that you can murder someone and feel comfortable with doing it and thinking that you're going to get away with it. And I think that's the part and parcel of what white supremacy, racism, and the systematic brutality has, has gone on un, uh, untried, unprosecuted, unjustified. And now we're seeing where the planet is rising up. They're having demonstrations in Tokyo, Japan, Black Lives Matter, Germany, Black Lives Matter. So that's telling us that the human condition is one that vibrates worldwide and that what affects one affects all. So those who have power and might are waking up this morning with a different idea and scope when you think about the magnitude of people power and people being able to take this thing and take anger to a level where they're destroying it and they're destroying the system. And, you know, it looks like it may be a Walmart or it may be a Macy's or maybe this or that. But when we look at the root of it, man, people are angry with the system and they don't have any way to express it in a lot of matters other than the strikeout. And for me, I don't, I don't justify it, but I realize it for like Dr. King realized. He said in 1968, the evil triplets of racism, militarism, and economic injustice. We have to fight with every given breath. So when, how can he tell young brothers in 1968 not to throw Molotov cocktails when this country is going over there to Vietnam, bombing the people and destroying the family unit? Mm -hmm. So it, it, that's where we are today. When we see the powerful protect themselves with the police force, with the military might, and be able to uphold racist doctrines, man. Yeah. For me, and, and on my level, when I look at the NBA, how can Donald Sterling, how can Donald Sterling be a racist and get two billion dollars for a golden parachute to leave the league? Yeah. That's telling you how many other people in the league have that same policy and mindset. Absolutely. Uh, and in your book, you had talked about it, and one of the reasons that you had approached other players to boycott Game One after the Rodney King beating is because you realized the riots in the media, there was a problem between the word thugs and the oppressed. And we're, we're seeing that again. This is, you know, decades later, and it is the same exact discussion. Do you think we will ever understand the difference between those two things? Hey, this, this is what's happening, man, is that what we're getting ready to overstand is redemption and reconstruction of a people. And that's what you're getting ready to see among the African people worldwide. And America's first. And that's why the world has Zion on America and how they're treating the former slave, because we're not slaves anymore. And that's the problem with the system. See, the system was built on us being slaves, period. No one wants to face that issue. No one wants to face that you're sitting on a capitalist system. You're at the top of it now, but your inheritance factor, the inheritance factor of where you're sitting on the job, the inheritance factor of whether you're a CEO of a Fortune 500 company that dates back 500 years, and, and how those, how the ramifications of that is, is coming up with this pimple that's rioting. But it's not rioting, it's rebellion against a, a, a system that is crooked at the core. So the foundation of America is one built on white exceptionalism in that. You know, and you know what's so wild to me, man, is I was studying Margaret Sanger and how the connections of, and it filters through to Hillary Clinton, and we were supposed to vote for Hillary Clinton as black folks, and everybody, hey, Hillary, Hillary. But we don't study. We don't study how Hillary Clinton was Margaret Sanger, is a uh, hoorah for Margaret Sanger who came up with this doctrine that I want to eliminate black people. And no, nobody want to question that as Americans. I'm talking about Americans question that. We have to look into ourselves. And when I'm putting myself as an American, I feel I have the right to do that because my people built the country. Now, going on that point, those who look at us in a blind eye and say, man, they ain't got no, ain't no, ain't no black fathers. No, you're killing them. So you asking young black men to grow up without fathers that they didn't seem murdered, and then you want them not to have some type of rebellious spirit about it? Come on. You know, how many fathers are in jail that could be out here in jail on trumped-up charges or on charges that are nowhere near 
them having 10, 15 years in prison away from these young boys on the street. So now me as a, me as a young brother looking out here and still being a young monster, how many brothers can I take under my wing who ain't got fathers around to take care of them? You know, and then how many of us don't have that mindset because we've been brought up on this capitalist system where it's all about me and I just want to get mine. So I want to be a multimillionaire so I can have 10 houses. And we got to break that model, man. So I love that MJ is coming out. Maybe that will break that model of I want to be like Mike and just be a millionaire and have cars and Maseratis and all of this. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying, man? So it's a whole new vibration going on, brother. And I'm so blessed. I feel so blessed to be on the planet to see it happening because when you say, it, man, it, it, it's happening right before our eyes. Yeah. So this is the whole prophecy that it, that was told. You know how long we've been here. Man, America's going to be shut down. You better make sure you have groceries for two weeks. Mm -hmm. You better make sure you have water. How long have we heard that? I'm 59. I heard that as a baby during the Civil Rights Movement, thinking that was when it was going to happen. Not knowing in 2020 was going to be the time that it is truly going to happen where America is going to be chaotic like a third world country. So what I'm looking at is Venezuela. What I'm looking at is Panama. What I'm looking at, and why is it happening to America, the richest, most powerful country by our president's standard? Mm -hmm. by, he says it all the time. We are the greatest, and everything is a competition. So within that, that's been the American mindset. Win, 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 win. Win at all costs. Win at all costs that we have to drop a bomb on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Win at all costs that we have to destroy the planet Earth. Win at all costs, Western Empire, starting with Britain. Mm -hmm. Why are you in the shape that you're in? Why are you in the shape that you're in, America? And see, we are who we are. We here. We, it's not like we have a choice where our souls come down, man. Yeah. You know? And it bothers me. I mean, did you ever, looking back now, do you consider your activism at that time so ahead of its time, even though it cut your career short? Do you see that as your legacy? Would, would you do it all over again? No, I'm seeing that's the part. Me and my son talk about it. We laugh about it. And my other son went to a demonstration. He out in California. He went to a demonstration yesterday in San Diego. And, he, and that's the first one he's ever went to. And he's like, man, Dad, I see where you're coming from, man. I understand you now. And he said, man, I was wrapped up into it. I said, yeah, you were doing something bigger than yourself, huh, son? He said, man, and I never felt like that before. I said, yeah, you've been on championship teams, but it ain't nothing like that, huh? I was like, yeah, because when you're standing on principles that undergird humanity, something that date, predates yourself, that's something, man. And, and to feel that and have that energy is something that's powerful and that's something that is only captured in certain generations. And this generation is being able to feel a palpable energy where something has been wrong on the planet for so many millennia, and now it's time to change it. And when I look across the spectrum of leadership across America, and I see how many African-American women are in positions of power, I see the transitional phases coming where the African woman is being restored to her rightful place under the sun, and we are experiencing the birthing pains of that. <laughs> well, I, I, I can't thank you enough for what you've done in the past and for doing this interview. But again, like I said, being uh, an NBA fan, white guy in the suburbs and, and, and watching your career and what you've done and what you stood for, I, I commend everything. I, we're catching up to you, Craig Hodges. Uh, brother, you know, it's so crazy. You know, say you and I have, um, have two-year-olds mm -hmm. right now, okay? I have an 11-month-old. Oh, great, great. Okay, mm -hmm. I don't. But for sake of, sake of what we're talking about, I do. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, if we put them on the ground together in the playpen, they ain't going to see white or black. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. They not. They not. If, we, if I came onto this planet and, I, and everything was just people, that's a people. That's a people. That's a people. You know, and people who look how they look. And they have whatever you they have, but somebody put into my mind that white is better than black. As a little boy, mm -hmm. as a little boy, as a, as a nine-year-old going to the park, we had to be back on the other side of the tracks because if we weren't, white was going to get you. And that's a sad state of affairs to put on the mind of a young person who's ready to be a brilliant spectrum of what God has in store for their lives. All of that is stunted by 
uh, a falsehood yep. that just because you look different than me, you're better than me. And that garbage is dead. Yeah, no, I, I, I thank you again, man, and and uh, I, I push everyone to go pick up the book Long Shot, especially now. It resonates in 2020 even more than it did a couple of years ago when it first came out. And and thank you for talking to me today, Craig. I, I appreciate you, man. And to all you listeners, everybody, be safe, drink plenty of water, and stay out of the way of the madness. Again, you mean a lot to me, Craig Hodges. Thank you for everything you do. All right, peace, brother. The No Sports Report is produced and distributed by Treefort Media. The show is executive produced by Kelly Garner, Lisa Ammerman, Matthew Kugler, and me, Jensen Karp. Tom Monahan is our senior audio engineer and sound supervisor, with production and editing by Jasper Leak. Additional production help from Tim Schauer, June Rosen, and Haley Mandelberg. Our theme music is composed by Spilkes. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, please subscribe, rate us, and review us on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please visit feedingamerica.org. If you're able to make a donation, any amount makes a difference, and you can learn more about other ways you can help on their website. For more information on the No Sports Report, links to the socials, and for show transcripts for our hearing-impaired listeners, go to treefort.fm. Be safe and be well. The No Sports Report is a production of iHeartRadio and Treefort Media. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.